So this is what we are going to do today. Let's meet our game. We are going to make a very simple Defend the Castle game. This is also online right now on GitHub, in our samples folder. There are going to be three bridges connecting the island from one side to the other. We'll have androids made of cardboard follow a path through the bridges and onto our castle trying to invade it. We will be adding stereoscopic VR rendering so it will work on the viewer later. We'll be adding binaural audio. Now, audio is really important for a complete and immersive VR exper um, experience. 3D auditory cues will tell you when a cannon is being shot over your head and where to look. Finally, we will add some interaction using the input and the reticle. This will work both for gaze and the old cardboard and for the controller on Daydream. Oh, and this. How many of you made games? Put up your hands if you're a game developer. Did you ever run into throttling that your GPU or CPU went too hot and you needed to take a break until you can keep uh, working? Or, you know, maybe you're like me and you just put your phone into the fridge for it to cool down? So we are going to look into some optimization tips so you can get at 60 FPS and avoid being throttled. Now, these are the assets we'll be using in the game, assets I've made before. We have the cannon and the castle. They're really simple. And some trees I took off the Cardboard Design Lab, which is also open source online. Now, this is how we are going to make this. To make the game, I've used Unity and Blender. But you can use any other tool off the market, and whatever you like, even if you have your own engine, there is a C++ SDK, which will be introduced in more detail at Nathan Mart's talk later. OK, so a very quick overview into Unity, if you've never used it before. I'm going to go through it very briefly. This is how a Unity game editor looks like. At the center, we just have our 3D scene. We can move it and look around using a virtual camera. We can also drab, uh, drag and drop objects in the scene to move them around. On the left is the scene arcade. That's the objects that we have inside the scene. On the right is the inspector. You can look at any object and see what it is made of. Every object is made of several components. For example, here on the top is the transform component, saying what's our position, rotation, and scale. And at the bottom is the project assets. That's all of the scripts, models, and textures inside our project. Now, a very quick word about Blender. As a game developer for many years, I found that having some 3D editing skill really empowers you, because it means you can make your own models and experiment and make your own game if you want. However, this is how Blender looks like. Now, Blender is an open source project which is free for everyone to use, which is why I picked it. And this is how it looks, and it can be a bit intimidating. I've learned how to use it through this site, but I'm pretty sure there are many other websites out there. OK, let's get to work very quickly and see how far we can go. So I'm just going to open up Unity. If you have it and you've downloaded the project, feel free to do the same. And I'll create a very simple, empty project to get started with, just to show you the basics, really. So this is how a new project looks like. I have the scene. I can press Alt and look around or with the mouse wheel button. And I can go to the game object menu at the top and maybe add a plane to use as my ground. And now it's inside the scene. I have a beginning a starter camera, the main camera, which I can move around. On the bottom right, you can see that's the camera preview and what it will see. Now, if I add just a cube for reference, and I'm starting very basic, and we'll go on in a bit. So now I have a cube in the scene. And I can press play here at the top. And basically, we get what we see is what we get kind of editor. However, there are some problems here. The biggest of, we don't have stereoscopic rendering. Luckily, it is really simple to get it with our SDK. Now, I have downloaded the package for 
importing the Google VR SDK just before. And this is simply a Unity package. I can double click on it, and it will load all the relevant assets into our project. Now, next, I'm just going to delete the main camera because we no longer need it. We want to have stereoscopic view. So I'm deleting that. And as you may see, here down at the project assets, we have the Google VR folder now. So I'll go into it, and I'll go to prefabs. And then I'll drag the Google VR main into the scene and place it just here at the back. Now, a prefab is basically a collection of game objects already set up with components. So in this case, this is what we need to do stereoscopic rendering. I can press play, and now we have all we need for VR. If I press Alt, I can simulate head movement, use my mouse, and look around. The stereoscopic camera basically works if I open up it on the left in the hierarchy. It has a head and a stereo renderer. The head also has a camera, which is a template camera for two different cameras, one camera for each eye, simulating the distance between our two eyes, basically. This is how we do the illusion of depth and depth sensation. So we know how far someone on the crowd is from me, or I am from you all. OK, now let's open up a project I have prepared beforehand so we can get started. Because if I start making the entire scene from scratch, it's going to take quite a while. And we won't make any game like it. So this is the very basic scene. I can move inside by zooming in using the scroll wheel or the trackpad. And I can look around. And let's see what we are going to do. So we have our castle made of cardboard. And on the other side of the island, we have the little android statue signifying where the invading androids will come from. Here on top of the castle, we also have our cannon that we'll be using to fire at the androids. And again, all the assets here, including the scenes, are already ready for you to download off GitHub. If I press play, I've already prepared the camera on top of one of the towers, so I can look around and see where the androids will come from. However, nothing is happening at the moment, so we'll need to add some gameplay. So let's see how we are going to add androids to spawn from uh, somewhere in the island. So I'm just going to disable a few things on the left. I'm going to create a new game object, let's say just an empty one, and I'm going to call it Spawner, because this is what's going to spawn my androids from. So I'm doing it here on the right at the inspector. Now, I'm going to create a new component, and I'll just call it Spawner because it's simple. And then I can double click the script here on the inspector to open it up in MonoDevelop or whatever script you want to use. I'm going to add a short timer. I'll start it at maybe one second to begin with. Oops. And let's add another one for respawn time. And set it up to five seconds. Now, on the update, what we should be doing is decrease our timer so we can get new androids into our scene. So we'll use time delta time. And then if our timer is, well, I keep getting code completion errors here. Oh, before I can spawn Androids, I need to have some locations I can spawn them from. So let's add a list of transformations Call it spawn points and just initialize it here. OK, so now if I look into the scene, you see that the spawner script is going to update in just a moment. There we go. 
So now we have the timer and the response timer, and we'll be able to add some points to let the, to let the script know where to place Androids at. We also need to create a path into the island. So for that, what we can do, just to make it simple again, I'll create a new game object that will, that will be a sphere, and I can place it somewhere inside the scene. And this signifies a point in space at the moment. I'll just remove the sphere collider so objects do not collide with it later on. And then I'll add a waypoint script, which I've prepared beforehand. All it does is have a list of what's the next point going to be. And then I can duplicate this, just Command C, Command V, and I can go into the first sphere and drag and drop the sphere from the hierarchy into the next, so I can have them link to each other. And then I'll have to keep doing it until they cross over the bridge and go to the castle. But this is just a way to start. So now that we have some objects, and we'll go to our spawner, and we'll add the initial point into the spawn points. And now, if the timer is less than zero, then we'll just set the timer back to the respawn timer. And we'll go to an Android pool, which I'll go to in more detail later. And I'll create the position, not at my position. I'm going to do a transform, create transform. And I'll use the size of the elements inside my list. There we go. Have we missed a bracket somewhere? All good. OK, and now that we have the two set up, and we'll press play again. If we go over to the scene view, we'll see every few seconds, every five seconds specifically, we'll have an Android coming up. Now, I'm not going to create the entire path here because I think that editing should be done later. It's not very interesting. So I do have enemies path. And if I go to layers here at the top right and mark invisible to enable it, we can see them in here. And I'll just collapse it. I'll decollapse this one. I'll go to the spawner, and I'll drag and drop my waypoints here from the left and onto the list. And now that I press play again, we'll have Android spawning from virus spawn points here on the scene, and we'll go over to the castle. So the different paths. OK. So we have basic Androids coming to the scene. We can look at them from the game. I can also maximize it so you might be able to see it. But we don't have any way to interact with them. We need some kind of a way to shoot them off our island so they don't get to the castle. So let's look into our ground. Let's look at how are we going to shoot with the cannon onto the ground somehow. So selecting the terrain, I'll go to Add Component, and I'll add a target behavior. And we'll just make a very quick script so we can shoot onto the cannons. I don't actually need the start or update here. So what we, I'll do is make a new function on click, and then I'll use the base event data from Unity. And then I'll cast it into a pointer event data. Here. Maybe I'll actually name this.
But before that, I need to make sure I actually have a Canon inside the scene. So I did add one beforehand. So I'll just make sure it actually exists. And now we'll make the Canon shoot from the Canon side of the scene onto the intersection point. Yeah. What am I missing here? One of those brackets. Oh, I'm using the wrong script. Sorry about that. And all I'm going to do is use the transformation from the raycast. And I'll get to more detail on that in a moment. Let's see. What position? That sounds about right. OK, but even now, if I press into the terrain, nothing will happen. We need to add a few more interactions here. The first thing we need to do is add a way to receive events from Unity and from our Google VR SDK, so we know when an object had actually been clicked in any way. So I'm going to add a event system from Unity. The event system, all it does is relaying the events between objects. So it comes with a standalone input module, which I'm going to remove, because we are not going to use it. And I'll add a gaze input module. This is basically going to take the orientation of our camera and transform it into the events. At the moment, there is not such element for the controller, but this will be coming soon. So the next thing I need to do is go to my camera inside Google VR main, go to the main camera template, and we'll add a physics ray caster. Now, on its own, the event system will allow you to interact with UI canvas elements. But if you want to interact with objects inside the scene, you need to add um, a physics ray caster for it to interact with them. So I'm going to set the event mask. The event mask basically says which layers in the scene are interactable. I will just set it up to nothing. And then I'll set it again to the grid. The grid is the name I chose for the terrain. You can see it here up on layer that it is selected as grid. And that means that when the gaze input module is looking into the camera, finding its views, it's going to find exactly which object it is looking on, but only from the layers that you have enabled. So the next thing we need to do, OK, now we have everything kind of working and interactable, but we never actually call our script from anywhere. So going back to our terrain, I'll just click on it here in the editor. What we need to do, and this is our water, so click again on the terrain, is create an event trigger. What the event trigger does is basically say that this object is looking, is listening for the following events. And I'll add a pointer click event. And then I'll select the same object I can just drag and drop it from here, from the scene on the left, into the missing component. And then it shows me all the components that are on this object, and I can select the one I want. So I've made a, terrain be a target behavior. So I'll just select on click. And when I press play the next time, and I look around, I'll be able to activate the cannon and we'll be able to fire onto the Android. However, it's actually really difficult, and I'll just put it for screen, actually. It is actually really difficult to aim this way. I, like, I have no idea where I'm pointing at. I'm just doing this at random, almost. So what I'm going to do is add a reticle. So I'll search here in the project assets, and I'll find the Google VR reticle. And what I'm going to do is drag it down onto head. And I'll make sure that its position is reset here in the inspector. It already is, so it's good. And the next time I start my scene, you see there is a little point 
in the middle of the screen, which is telling me where I'm looking at. Now, if it looks at an object that is marked as interactable, it will grow to signify that the object can be interacted in some way, and I can shoot there. However, once again, we have gameplay, we have some minimal interaction, but the game feels somewhat empty. I mentioned before in the presentation that to make a really good virtual reality experience, you want to have sound. So let's look into how we're going to add some sound in. So I want to have an epic sound for the cannon whenever I shoot at the androids. So I'm going to look into my cannonball object. The cannonball object is spawned every time where I select to shoot somewhere into the scene. The first thing I will do is I will add an audio source. If you have listened to the binaural audio presentation earlier, you might be familiar with it. But this is our Google VR implementation of 3D binaural audio. And you can use it just like this. Now it's on the object. I'm going to select a specific sound, the cannonball fire sound. I've also prepared the, the cannonball behavior script, which is what controls the flight of the cannon and then the explosion at the end. And it has another element here for the impact audio. So I'll just go in here and I'll select the cannon impact here on the left. And if we look quickly on the cannonball behavior, we'll see this on impact script here at the bottom. And what it does is select the script, the variable which I have just filled in, and it will play it once our cannonball is just about to hit the ground inside the on update. It's a pretty short script, so if you're following on the YouTube video later, you can easily find it all. Now, here you have additional settings for the sounds. In this case, I want it to be an epic explosion, so I'm just going to put the gain on the max and hope it will all work well on the speakers here. But you also have settings for directivity, which is how the sound is going to distribute and spread out in space. If I set this here, you'll see the circle showing how the sound waves will, will spread. If I use the alpha, you see it become larger on the front, and then it will spread more towards the back. Well, if I use the sharpness, it will make it more sharp, as you would expect. So give it more of a direction. For the cannonball, I'll use a sound that spreads in everywhere at the same time. You can also enable occlusion for the sound to bounce off elements into the scene, from the scene, but I'm going to skip that at the moment. Now, I kind of want to press play and just see how the sound is working, but it will not work. There's one more step we need to do. If I go edit here on the top and to project settings and go to audio, we need to set the Specializer plugin here on the right from None to Google VR Audio Specializer. And once again, all of these instructions will be in the GitHub README file. Now, the next time I press play, when I fire at Androids, and I'll maximize this again, here's one. It's coming. There we go we'll have some 3D audio. Now, if you're with speakers on a device, or even on the computer, you'll find out that when you look in different directions, the stereo sound will come as you'd expect it to come from. I also want to add some sounds to the androids, but I'm going to cheat here because I have a lot to cover, so a lot of it is prepared beforehand. I'm just going to look for the android. I'm going to search here in the project. I'll find the Android prefab, and I'm going to add another Google VR audio source component. Now, I'm not going to set any sound in here. I'm going to disable the play on the wake. This is because I've already set some sounds here in different lists. And if we go into the script itself, you'll notice there are multiple lists of audio clips. 
And when we enable the Android, it will play the charge sound. And when it's going to be exploded away by the cannon, we'll play an impact sound, just as an example. Now, when I press play, every time an Android will spawn, it will have some kind of a charge. And when I shoot towards it and hit it, it will have an oh-oh sound and fly away. You'll probably hear it better on a device. You can get the APK from the GitHub. It's online right now. So this is the Google VR interaction, the stereoscopic rendering, and the audio. Another, a few quick more words about the interaction. When you are pointing at an element, let's do it as an example, I'm going to maximize it. The reticle is quite smart, actually. In VR, you really need to be able to converge exactly where you're looking at. And the reticle tends to take the depth of the element that you're pointing at. So if we are pointing at the terrain here, it's not only spreading up out to show that the terrain is interactable, but it's actually casting its position onto the depth of the terrain itself. However, in this case, I have not set the trees to be occluders inside the event mask, as well as the tower, which means that the reticle is probably rendering in front of them, but still being visible, which can make some issues with convergence, especially if I look down here onto the terrain, but also onto the tower. So what you want to do in these cases is go to your uh, main camera and add some more elements into the event mask down here. Uh, so for example, if we add the default, you'll notice that whenever we are looking onto a tower or a tree, it will, nev it will no longer grow. And the depth will be cast properly in the reticle. Now, I have just about 15 minutes. And this is a very basic game. But I really want to talk about performance here. When I was making this demo, I had about two and a half weeks to do it. And I was trying to do some really fancy stuff. However, doing work and working on a game demo at the same time actually turned out to be pretty difficult. And after the game was finished, it maybe ran at like 45 frames per second, which is not great. Now it's running on 60 FPS on the device at full resolution. But this gave me even more first-hand experience to give you some performance tips. So let's look into them. If we look into the Google VR, we will notice that we have a VR mode enabled, which is what we want to do. But we also have distortion correction. If we press play and we look into the distortion, you can set it to none, which means it's not going to fix the distortion. The, the distortion is concussion distortion caused by the lenses when you're looking through them onto the screen. You want to, to use distortion correction. However, there are several ways to do so. If you have watched the Vertex distortion correction presentation, I'm not sure if it was before mine or after, but it mentions a way to do correction without post-processing. The way we do it here, is by doing it on a post-process, which means we will need to draw every pixel again with the correction. The vertex correction happens when you're drawing the objects themselves onto the screen, and it will distort them to fit and look how they should be, so you don't need to use additional pixel rendering time and waste more of your GPU bandwidth, because that tends to be one of the more expensive things. So, if I'm not using the vertex-based correction, I'll use either native or Unity. In this case, I'm using Unity. And you can play with the stereo screen scale. That changes the virtual display that we are drawing to. When we are drawing our, our scene, our game or application, we're actually drawing it into an off-screen buffer, which is a larger size of our real screen. We do it so we can completely remove any, any artifacts and distortion and not lose any of our details. So we are losing the, we are fixing the pixel er error by drawing on high resolution. But sometimes, depending on the device, you'll find that the generated resolution is too high. And you might want to change it from 1 to maybe 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. 
I'm going to leave it at, nine, at a one here because it's working quite well. Now, the other thing you can do is go into your edit menu and go into project, and we'll just look into quality here. So I like to make a new quality level. I call it Google VR, or GVR for short, and I set Android to be the default, um, use it by default. Now, depending on your scene, if you're using a lot of lighting or heavy shaders, I'd suggest to bake all your lighting into a texture. I'm not going to go over how to do it now. There's enough information on it online. But in that case, you can lower your pixel uh, count. And depending on your scene, you might even be able to move to vertex lighting. But that's in a different menu, so I'll go to it later. If you're not using soft particles or any reflections, you might want to disable this. I do suggest keeping multi-sampling at least at two. When you're looking into the screen through the lenses and you don't have multi-sampling on, then you will see all the aliasing and jagged edges. And that's not a pretty experience on your eyes to see all those jagged edges. So try to make sure that your game or application is performing well enough to enable anti-aliasing at at least 2x. Two, two because otherwise, it's just not going to look as great, unless you're rendering at much higher resolution. Now, as I mentioned, if you can play with your shadows, uh, play with your light, try to bake your shadows as well. And then if you can, you can disable your real-time shadows or set it to hard shadows only. Another thing you can do is change the shadow cascades instead. Now, if we go into, oh, and shadow cascades is multiple shadow maps used to have different qualities between shadows that are near the camera or further away because the shadows near the camera needs to be higher quality because the player can see all of the artifacts happening. Now, another thing we can do is go here into player. You have to set your default orientation to landscape left to work with the, with the viewer. Another thing you might be able to do to gain more performance and sometime quality over mobile is disable the 3D bit display buffer. The reason for it is because some phones do not actually have 32 bit support and they emulate it using half points. So on some Galaxy phones, for example, you're getting more shadow artifacts without it because of the emulation layer. And then if you're using only 16 bits, you are getting less bandwidth usage, which means you're getting more performance and less heat is being generated on the hardware itself. If we go to other setting, as I mentioned earlier, you can change to vertex lighting, or you can keep it at forward if you have good enough performance, depending on how you have made your scene and your game. I do very much recommend enabling multi-threaded rendering because that is going to take a big chunk of your CPU usage to another thread. And then you can do more, and you will not be as CPU throttled later for heating up one core and using all the bandwidth there. You should use the static and dynamic batching. What that does is reduce your draw calls. So if I go to the game and I press on the stats over here, you can see that I have about 166 draw calls inside this scene, and I have 162 vertices. If I press play, I'm going to have double that amount, or just about double that amount, because Unity is going to be able to opt optimize to some level. The reason for it is because we are drawing the scene twice. So it's doing double the work, and you need to make sure that you're not having too many vertices in the scene or too many triangles. Another thing that I've noticed with Unity, and you might be familiar with it, especially if you've worked with C++, is that it doesn't really like instantiating objects. That means a lot of memory allocations. And for that, I've made a specific memory pool. So if you look at the memory pool in here, you see it will have two scripts, one for cannonballs and one for the androids. 
when I press play, as this object is being initialized, it's creating all these unused cannonball elements and the androids, which are slowly being used. When I shoot a cannonball, let's say over here, you see one cannonball is being used here at the top, and in a few seconds it will be disabled and ready to be used again. This is to avoid heavy memory allocations, which can be very expensive at runtime. So the way I make a script like that is by creating a single tone and then having a couple of static functions, one to create an element and one to destroy. On the initialization of the script, it's going to make sure if there is no single tone to set its own. And then it will create however many instances of the object that I set it to do. In this case, I've put it on the code. You should put it as a variable instead. OK, so I've managed to finish a little bit ahead of time, which never happened when I tried to do it before. 